So what does Pittsburgh have to do with Pensacola? <laughs> well, I'm going to try to connect those two tonight, but I'm going to connect them um, in several ways. One is there's a common theme, I think, running around the country right now, and I want to talk a little bit about that, and, and then a little bit about our Pittsburgh, our experience there, and then some of the lessons I learned as a mayor in trying to turn it around the city, and what I've observed for the last four years, traveling a great deal uh, with the Urban Land Institute, uh, uh, and uh, helping with the Katrina rebuilding along the coast, and to uh, lots of other cities around the country that I think are are relevant lessons for every community because uh, we are in the middle uh, uh, of a, 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 we are at the beginning really of this moment in time that I think is a remarkable period. How many of you have ever heard of Horatio Nelson Jackson? Nobody knows and he changed all of your lives. There's one guy over here who's with you all eye because he's heard the story. I want to tell you the story, okay, because I think it's relevant today. Horatio Nelson Jackson was a doctor from Vermont and he was out of California at a medical convention and he was out to dinner one night with a group of other doctors and they were debating what the impact would be of, of the car in American society. And all the other doctors thought it was really the toy for the rich. There was no infrastructure at the time, no gas stations, no uh, repair stations, and it wasn't, the roads weren't, there weren't many roads, and there was not going to be a lot happening. Horatio thought it was going to be um, a huge impact on society, it was going to be a game changer, and he bet them all $50 that night that he could drive across the United States in 90 days. It was 1903. Uh, in 1903, uh, there were 8,000 cars in America, 150 miles of paved road, and no highway department in any state. The very next day, he went out and bought his first car, a Winton. He convinced the young mechanic, Seawall Crocker, to go with them. And for whatever reasons, they bought a dog named Bud that day. And the three of them, two days later, with absolutely no planning whatsoever, are on the road driving across the country. In most of the towns they were going through, school let out and everybody came out because it was the first car they had seen. They had to use railroad bridges to get across the major um, rivers in the, in the west because there was no other way to do it. Uh, 63 and a half days later, uh, Horatio Seawall and Bud drove down Fifth Avenue in New York City. They were the first people to drive across the United States. That was in 1903. By 1923, 1923, there were 10 million cars, hundreds of thousands of miles of paved road, and a highway department in every state. In 20 years, America as we knew it changed. And we're sitting there now where Horatio was. The world is in the midst of, I think, the most remarkable change we will see in generations. And there is, you know, these are forces, whether you like it or not, the world is changing, and it's going to change in remarkable ways. And communities that figure it out that figure out how to position themselves are going to be communities that compete in a different economy than what we have today. Uh, one of the first drivers is globalization. You have a port. You see it firsthand. You're competing with every port up and down the East Coast and across the Gulf, chasing the China traffic that's coming through the Panama Canal in a couple years. Whether you'll be successful or not, in part depends on how you see the future and how you make investments uh, to be able to compete. Uh, and the second is climate change. And, and you can believe it or not believe it, get over it. It's going, to change, it's going to change the conversation. It's changing it already. The Business Owners and Management Association believes that a Class A office building within five years will have to be a certified green building. A, a thousand mayors across the country have said basically that they're going to lower their carbon emissions by so much. And um, technological innovation, we, we wouldn't have seen that uh, little commercial at the beginning five years ago would we? Because most of us probably weren't carrying cell phones five or certainly ten years ago. And, and yet today, we pretty much all have them. And um, infrastructure needs, if you're going to be a successful port, you need to make investments in infrastructure. If you're going to be a successful city, you need to make investments in infrastructure. And the fifth, which is a relentless number, is demographics. If I say what's one of the fastest growing, the top three to five fastest growing countries in, Amer in the world, would you think America is one of those? It is. Really? We're the fourth fastest growing country in the world. It's not Indonesia. Indonesia's ahead of us, but it's not the African countries. We're adding 120 million more people to the United States in the next, in the next 25 years. What does that mean? 
It means that Washington, D.C. and the metro area, they have to absorb an additional 600,000 households. And Atlanta, which is already looking at Chattanooga as a suburb, has to absorb another 600,000 households in the Atlanta area by the population projections. San Francisco in the Bay Area, they're looking at having to build additional 500,000 houses in the Bay Area. That means Las Vegas is going to be their suburb. Think about what that means and how do you manage that and is sort of the Aussie and Harriet forms of development that we've had for the last 50 years, is that sustainable? Because adding 600,000 more houses to Atlanta, if we follow the same patterns of development, puts it in Chattanooga and, and maybe all the way to Pensacola. So th that's the reality of what we're facing. I, I mean, this is, these are real numbers. And, and so let's talk a little bit about globalization. You know, how many of you remember Ozzy and Harriet? So Ozzy and Harriet defined who we were, right? It was mom and dad and two kids and a car and a white picket fence in a nice little suburban house. Now, if you watch television, it's sex in the city and friends and sort of defines. But back then, 80% of the households in America were Ozzie and Harriet. They were married couples with kids. How many households in America do you think now have kids? 25%. Less than 50% of the households in America are married couples. So that has huge implications for real estate. But the, for the conversation, Ozzie and Harriet and that view of America and sort of has defined the development trends for the last 70 years really was defined by cheap energy. And when we, Ozzie and Harriet, were TV stars back in the late 50s and 60s, uh, the, the, the energy we used was... 100% domestically produced. We were getting all of it from America, uh, from the drilling off the Gulf Coast and other places, and we were using the same amount. By, by 1970s, when Jimmy Carter had a national address and said the, um, the, the, uh, the, within the middle of the embargo, some of you might remember that, and, we, and he said basically that you know, we need the equivalent of war to become energy independent. 25% of the oil we were using was coming from um, coming from foreign sources. What do you think it is today? It's 75% of the oil we're using today is coming from foreign sources. So when you fill up your car in the next couple of days, you thank President Chavez from Venezuela because 25% or 12% of the oil we're using in the United States today is coming from Venezuela. What's your definition of insanity? You keep doing the same bad things over and over again. And that, and that, I mean, our whole economic health in this country is dependent on people who don't like us. Chavez, the single largest increasing source of oil for us is Russia. And of course, then there's the Mideast. We're, you know, we're one war away from having an economic meltdown because the oil would not be available to us. So, so if there is a, and, and then we have China and India, you know, wanting, uh, wanting to live like we do. And China, in the next year or two, will surpass us in the number of automobiles owned. Um, you know, they weren't in the top 10 five years ago. And, and so this whole thing of globalization and the, and the demand for diminishing resources become a huge issue. I mentioned climate change. And again, in climate change, if you look at it really is carbon uh, production is the cause of it. And, and, and there are really three major sources. One is sort of the industrial sector. Uh, about a, a third of it is coming from that, and uh, about a third of it is coming from where we live and work. I don't know if this is a certified green building, Ken, but if, if it's not, it's coming from here and it's coming from houses. It's, it's, so we, we produce that carbon, and, and the other third is coming from us driving everywhere, uh, uh, the transportation. And so you, you have two-thirds of the, of the carbon um, production in the United States connected to climate change, really connected to real estate about where the buildings we live in and how we move back and forth to get to those buildings. And, uh, and it, it has huge implications on, on the design of communities, uh, of how we begin to control that. I, I don't need to talk about technology. It, you, you see it every day. I mean, I'm, I don't know about you, but I, at most points, feel fairly obsolete at this point. I can't even work my own television anymore, let alone, let alone uh, uh, other things. And so, so we are watching technology begin to refine um, our, our lives. And, and this is infrastructure. If your son or daughter came home with this report card, would you be a happy camper? 
And yet this is our report card as a country of infrastructure, of the infrastructure that we depend on every day. And pretty much every week in the front page of the paper now, you read about a failure of infrastructure in the country. Uh, most recently, uh, a gas line blowing up in California and wiping out a whole neighborhood and uh, you know a bridge falling down in Minneapolis and several bridges in Pennsylvania where I'm from and a levee failing in New Orleans and a host of other infrastructure and, and, and it, is, it is a reflection in this report card done by the Society of Engineers of uh, our, our stagnation in continuing to invest in infrastructure in this country and, and it's not a you know, nobody wants to pay more in gas taxes and nobody wants to pay more in other things. But think for a moment of, of the generations before us. Think of maybe the only last honest politician we had, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s said, America needs a, a modern highway system. It's a highway system for national security, uh, for economic competitiveness, and for mobility for its citizens. And we need to build it. And he proposed building the interstate highway system and funding it through a gas tax. We hadn't had a gas tax before federally. And in all the rhetoric you hear today, Dwight Eisenhower wrote in the 1950s, we can't afford it over my dead body. Am I going to vote for gas taxes? Dwight Eisenhower got that through. I want you to think a moment for what America would look like if we didn't have the interstate highway system. How would we move around? How would we deal with the congestion of, uh, that, uh, that we have now, let alone what, we would, what we're going to have in the next 25 years? And, 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 yet, and yet, so that level of conversation about how you make investments and the importance uh, of why we need to do that. And this is what I mentioned about the demographics. These are the projections for, uh, for the United States over the next up until 2050, and as you can see, uh, our population increase is one of the fastest growing in the, in the world. Uh, part by, because of immigration, uh, in part by natural birth, but we are a country that is growing rapidly. And, and so when we talk about infrastructure, we talk about how do you build sustainable communities, um, you've got to think about how you begin to absorb not just what you have, uh, where most of us have already congested, but how you begin to absorb uh, millions of people. Uh, and by communities, hundreds of thousands at least. Let me switch gears a moment and talk about uh, my city, Pittsburgh, uh, because it has some relevance to this conversation. Uh, Pittsburgh was a city um, once defined as hell with the lid off. And how does it now become uh, the most livable city in America, ranked by both The Economist and by, uh, by Forbes magazine this year? How, do, how does that happen? How, how does it make that transformation to being one of the most environmentally degraded cities in the country, if not the world, to now viewed as one of the cleanest and most green cities in America? How, how does that happen? It happens because of civic and political leadership and, and the building of a public-private partnership that existed far before I became mayor but, um, but was of huge value in making the translation. Let me just, for a moment, did any of you watch the Tampa game? football game on Sunday. You know, the national commentators kept commenting about why half the crowd was rooting for Pittsburgh. And, and they assumed that everybody came down uh, to Tampa from Pittsburgh to, to watch the game. But the reality is, every time that happens, and it happens a lot when the Steelers are playing away, is that that's, that's a symbol of our failure. Because, because between 1970 and 1990, we lost 500,000 people from the Pittsburgh region. These aren't moving people. These aren't people moving from the city to the suburbs. These are people moving to Tampa and Houston and uh, a host of other places because we were a full sale collapse of the steel industry. Between 1978 and 1985, we lost 150,000 jobs in just the steel industry. And imagine the ripple effect that has through its economy. On our unemployment rate in the early 80s was about 25%. Uh, in Pittsburgh. And, and so we were facing uh, a challenge that I think now every city in America faces of sort of redefining what it's going to be and how it competes. And, and that challenge was forced on us in a way um, that most cities don't have. 
Uh, most cities are sort of doing okay. They're, they're growing. They're, maybe you're not completely happy with what happened, but it's doing okay. And, and for us, we didn't have just doing okay. We had to redefine our, our city. And, and so we began doing that both in training. Our community college system began to move uh, our workforce from uh, being a workforce uh, focused on the steel industry to retraining others. And a lot of people left because they didn't see an opportunity. We began to rebuild our Central, central City, you know, Pittsburgh, uh, the best comment about Pittsburgh back in the 60s and the 70s, 80s is that we were a gritty city. That was like a polite way of saying other things about us. And one of us was our central business district is uh, Pittsburgh is the confluence of uh, three rivers, the Allegheny and the Monongahela, which form the Ohio River. And right in that triangle is our central business district. And that blue box there is an area uh, that uh, was our, is a cultural trust district for us. And across the river is um, the blue areas, our new ballparks, which I'm going to show you. And uh, the big blue blob there in the uh, right in there is a new convention center, which uh, I'll touch on in a moment. So, so that cultural trust district there um, was was our red light district. It was one of the most notorious places in the country. We had 22 massage parlors, Adele theaters, and other sundry uses. But we had two wonderful old vaudeville theaters. One was at the time being used as a burlesque that uh, the Heinz Endowment, the Heinz Ketchup, saw value in. And Mr. Heinz began to buy some of these buildings. And, and today, uh, where there were 22 massage parlors and sundry other uses, we have 1,500 legitimate performances. Ballet and opera and symphony and two million people a year come into those, into that area to enjoy culture. It, it became a threshold driver. And we were talking a little bit about Pensacola. You have some of that. And, and, and we built our ballparks across the river because, because we wanted to reinforce this, which I'll touch on in a minute. And so, so this is a great example of culture and the arts as economic drivers, bringing two million people a year, supporting restaurants and galleries. Uh, uh, we located a, a performing arts high school uh, there for, and middle school for students and uh, suburban uh, kids. Uh, their families have to pay $15,000 to send their kids to this performing arts school, which they do because it's so highly regarded. This is a public school. Uh, our son went there for both middle school and, um, and high school. It, and so it's in the middle middle of, um, of the city. There's no uh, ball fields there, but there's great theaters uh, in, in the building. And, you know, for us, what was wonderful was that our, the, the cultural trust, the ballet, the symphony, the opera, uh, the theater would all, uh, the day before, if they hadn't sold out, I'd call the school and the kids could buy tickets for $5. And my son would, you know, come home and say, you know, we want to go to the ballet tomorrow night and I need some money to buy dinner. Isn't that a great way to live? For a, for a 15 year old kid. Isn't that the way you want 15 year old kids to think about life? Is to integrate it like that and have cities that work like that. And, um, and, it, and it drove uh, old buildings that were the massage parlors into uh, buildings that now house uh, apartments and galleries and, and restaurants. We captured public spaces where there were vacant lots. And I think surface parking lots and vacant spaces in cities are the deadliest land use. And so we tried to fill as many as we could with, you know, sculptures and activity and enliven a place because, you know, if you have to walk by a surface parking lot or a vacant lot that inevitably attracts litter, you know, it's, you want to get by there quickly, but this, people linger here because they like to see the fountain. And, and so there, these aren't, some of them are expensive, some of them are not expensive, but it's a way to, to begin to, to shape city. And let me just touch on this because PNC Bank, which is the sixth largest bank in America, is headquartered in Pittsburgh. And they proposed to build an operation center on an old railroad yard right in the downtown. And, and, and we wanted them to build it. And we uh, and part of the key to that for us, why did we want them to build it? Because there are almost 2,500 jobs in this building. And this, this is an op back office operations. That ends up normally out in the suburbs surrounded by 10 acres of parking. We wanted it into the city. And so we said, if you located that in the city, we'll finance uh, a transit stop for you on a subway line. We'll build a new one, about 10 million bucks, and we'll build a garage for you. 
because we want you to, to come down here. And so we did a TIF, which is a form of public finance. This is a public-private partnership. We provided the TIF, which is capturing the value being created by the new development and, and using it to finance some of the, the garage and the transit stop. And, and they invested, so we invested about uh, 40 million and they invested over 100 million dollars uh, in this building that brought 2,500 jobs in, into the city. This was our ballpark and this is what were architects smoking and drinking in the 60s? How many architects are here? Huh? I want to I know any architects designing building. What were you all drinking in the 60s and 70s? Because you built these buildings, these big iconic buildings, sort of with all built around the idea of the automobile, right? And, and so we build these stadiums with 30, 25 acres of parking around it. And people had to start tailgating because they wanted to do something before and after the game. And in the old time ballparks, Wrigley Field, you see, are ones that people, you know, there are bars and restaurants people walk to. So this is, this is what we did. <laughs> In 30 seconds, we took, got rid of it. And, and we, we, we built a new football stadium, Heinz Field, right on the river, and we bet, built a new best baseball stadium. This is ranked by ESPN and everybody else. There's the best baseball park in America. I take credit for the ballpark. We have the worst team in America. I don't take credit for that. Uh, and, and you can see they're right in the city, right across as you're looking out over um, the outfield there, you see the downtown, that bridge right there that you see. We shut that down in the ballparks and we control the parking garages so you can park downtown for $5. If you want to park across the street from the ballpark, you pay $25. Where do you think half the people going to the ballpark pay? They parked downtown, they walked through the Cultural Trust District, they used the restaurants, they used the bar, and they enjoy walking across the bridge. It, it integrates the, the city, it puts it together. So these deals aren't just transactional. They are connected to a broader strategy of how you make a community work. I see some of that in Pensacola. You, you're making those connections and that's part of the challenge. As I said that big blue mark right up at the edge of the Cultural Trust District. We, we built a new convention center. This is the largest certified green building in America. You know, when people first came to me and said, we want to build a certified green building, I had no clue what they were talking about, but it sounded like a good idea. Uh, you know, I didn't realize back, this is back in the early, in the mid-90s, uh, that, that, uh, that this would begin to be a defining piece of who we were as a city. As Pittsburgh, and I, I want to touch on this now because what you, if I say Pittsburgh, you would probably think of steel mills. You know, and we had steel mills in Pittsburgh. We had lots of them, but when I'm becoming mayor in 1994, they've all been vacant for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. They they look like this. They look like this. this. They were iconic, but they were sitting there vacant on some of the best property. And I had to make a choice as mayor. Uh, as a choice was whether I wanted to manage decline because Pittsburgh had been losing populations for 30 years and it wasn't attracting much industry and we were sitting with a thousand acres of vacant property or, or, or I, I, I needed to take a risk and say let's invest in the future. You know, that's a hard decision. Think about your own life when, you, when you're making that decision. You know, it's sort of like that hamster on the wheel. You can run as fast as you can. And running as fast as you can, you can use all your resources and all your energy just to keep running as fast as you can. And if you do that, you're not getting anywhere. So you need to think about how you shift some of your resources and some of your energy to investing in the future, to doing something different. And that inevitably entails risk, which lots of politicians get nervous about, okay? Because it means that you're gonna try to do something different and it might work but it might fail. And, 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 and that was where we were. And even as bad off as we were with, with our, our population dropping and our economy stagnating, people were really resistant to doing something different. In some ways, it was a little easier for us, maybe then in Pensacola, to, to change the dynamic because, because we, I mean, we had nothing to lose in a way, but people were so locked to the status quo. It's so hard to get people to change. So we went out, in my first year as mayor, I went to our redevelopment authority and I said, buy the steel mills. We bought 1,500 acres of steel mills. All along the river, people, 
you know, my, the first time I ran for re-election, my opponent, all we did was put ads of vacant steel mills and saying the mayor is wasting all of our money buying these when we could hire more police. That was the risk. Today, the one steel mill I just showed you is a technology center. It houses several thousand jobs. Our universities have research facilities there, and private companies are collaborating with the university doing research. Um, and this is some of the buildings over the last 15 years that have been built there. One of the more interesting things for me was connecting the two sides of the river was what we call the hot metal bridge. It's not about a rock group. It's about the steel industry hauling uh, molten iron across the river in huge cars. And we bought the bridge when we bought the mills. And, and people said, whatever you're going to do with that bridge. And we made, there were two little bridges. We made one into automobile traffic, but the other we connected, a, built a whole trail system in Pittsburgh, which I'll talk about in a minute. And, and, and this is on the other side of the river from the hot metal bridge. It looked like this. Now this mill has real special meaning to me because my father worked here for 51 years. And he made steel there for 51 years with 30,000 other men and women and now we have a cheesecake factory there. You know, my father were alive, he would have shot me. You know, I, I, it's a commentary on our times, I guess. But, but the reality is, is that we took this and we converted it into a mixed-use development of housing and retail um, and office buildings and a whole host of other things that have created huge value. Um, and I, I got to tell you this story because this is a good example. This is part of this steel mill site. And, and this is, um, you can see right back there um, is uh, a, an active railroad track. And here's the river. And, and these are practice fields, but the Pittsburgh Steeler, the president of the Pittsburgh Steelers, calls me up and the, with the president of our University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is by far our largest employer, and said, we want to build a world-class sports medicine facility and headquarters for the Pittsburgh Steelers and practice fields for the Steelers and, and for the University of Pittsburgh football teams. And, you know, we'd like to take that long, narrow piece of property and develop that. And they came to me and uh, and we said, that's great. We'd love to work with you to make this happen. And, and so we did that. And, and, and the architects came back, these architects again. And they came back and, and they designed, you know, everybody wants their own waterfront, right? Whether it's on a river uh, that used, nothing used to live in or uh, whether it's on the beach. And, and they had put all the buildings up against the river and pushed the road back against the railroad tracks. And we had wanted to build a park along there and there was no room for the park at all. And, and I called up uh, Dan Rooney and uh, the, the president and we went out to lunch and I said, you need to move your buildings back. Because part of our value in Pittsburgh is that we're gonna create a continuous riverfront park in Pittsburgh. And you need to know when I was growing up as a young boy, my mother always told us two things when we were going out to play. Be home before the street lights come on and never go near the rivers. And she would say, if you go in those rivers, you're gonna melt. Uh, is what she would say, okay, because they were so polluted at the time. And, 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 so, and so I said, you need to move them back. And we were at a very fancy club in Pittsburgh, and, and the waiter had to come over to tell us to keep it done, and we were disturbing other visitors. And I'm sure he was very embarrassed. But, um, but I, if you come to Pittsburgh today, there's, um, there's a riverfront park there that goes to Washington, D.C., there's a continuous off-road bike trail that now is the best bike ride in America, about five days, that goes from downtown Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. There are 30 miles of riverfront park now, continuous, in the city of Pittsburgh, in a city that never thought about using its rivers. Um, and, and Dan's big objection to this, though, was, was that if you build that, that, that trail there, I can only build eight, four 80-yard practice fields. So, so it was my fault when the Steelers can't score in the red zone, okay? <laughs> True story, there's 480-yard practice fields there, but they're still doing okay. And, and so, so a year and a half, two years after this opened, Dan's sitting in his office one day, and he calls up and he says, 
you know, we really did do the right thing, didn't we? I'm looking out my window and there's these families riding bikes and there's these um, older people uh, walking and riding bikes. And he said, it just is really great to see all that happening in Pittsburgh. It, it, that's, about, that's about community values. That's about deciding what you want to be, not looking at this, these, each of these deals as a transaction, but deciding what you want to be. How do you build this remarkable city that gets connected? Uh, and this is the money. I mean, we put $100 million into this deal of public financing from nine different sources. And, and there is now almost, this is a little old, there's almost $600 million worth of development there. American Eagle, if you have kids and they wear American Eagle clothes, they moved their headquarters from New York and uh, suburban area in Pittsburgh to locate here because they love the vibrancy and the vitality of, of the place. Uh, this is another development. In many ways, this was the most polluted place in Pittsburgh. It was a slaughterhouse rendering plan in a scrapyard. Um, for all of our lives. And when we bought the island, we bought this also, the, the slaughterhouse and rendering plant had been abandoned. And, and we bought this. People said, you know, the rats are as big as cats and the smell from the place, nobody will ever go near it. Today, there's new housing. There's uh, technology buildings in the back. And, it, and that's where the, the scrapyard was. It was an environmental disaster. We cleaned it up and to the point where we could build housing. Uh, again, public-private partnership with the financing. And in many ways, this was the most remarkable one. Any of you know where slag is? Slag's a byproduct of steel. It's not particularly toxic. It's a little bit toxic, but it, it's, they make a lot of it in the steel-making process. It's like a cinder. And, and it was, that, that face there is 300 feet high. Slag had been dumped there for 90 years. It was... It was um, it, it, it's 250 acre site sitting up right up against several nice neighborhoods and 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 I would run down there for 30 years down through that little trail there and I came back one day after being mayor elected mayor for the first month thinking you know I'm mayor I can do anything right and <laughs> said well, my development people let's buy this site and do something with it and they thought I was crazy okay and so so we began working at it and we talked to the steel mill that was bankrupt and they agreed to sell it to us and, and we bought it and, and this is the story, this is the slag time. You can see it looks like the moon, nothing grows on slag. And, um, and, and we proposed building 700 new houses, adding a, of the 250 acres, create a new 150 acre park, uh, clean up a stream that had been badly polluted that runs up through that valley. And the first community meeting we go to, 200 people at the meeting and they all wanted to keep the slag done. Because change is tough. You know, they, didn't, they were worried about traffic and they were worried about noise. They were worried about us polluting them with the dust from the... There was a, a thousand reasons why nobody wanted to change. Now, I thought, I'm a new mayor, right? I'm thinking people are going to love me. So when I show up at a meeting and 200 people are against it, I start wondering about my profession. Today, we've built 400 houses of the 700 houses. It's the most successful development in the Pittsburgh region, outperforming every suburban. It's, an, it's very much like these houses here. It's a new urbanist development. Instead of putting one or two units per acre, there are 15 to 20 units per acre here. And, uh, you know, and it, the garage, I remember I brought a tour of some developers from a suburban community, and they said, boy, there are lovely houses, but where do people park? Because, you know, why do we spend, spend $500,000 on a house and the major part of it is big garages in the front? The garages are in the back. There's alleys. It's, it's what we all loved about small cities in the, in the 30s. And, and that stream that was so badly polluted, we, some really smart engineers, we had to... Uh, uh, a mile of it had been culverted for a hundred years. We dug it up and daylighted the stream and these really smart young engineers figured out how to, how to create the, the pools and the ripples and, and, and uh, build a series of wetlands to, uh, to filter the stream that was being polluted both by slag runoff and sewage runoff from suburban uh, communities, older suburban communities, and now there are fish there. 
I mean, when you go down there and you see people fishing, you want to say, you shouldn't eat those fish. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it's a remarkable, I mean, it's, it's for those of us who grew up in Pittsburgh, it's this remarkable story. Who were our partners in this? The biggest partners uh, were what, you, what we're here tonight in part celebrating is, it, or our universities, okay? Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh. So as our steel industry is collapsing, when I'm a young boy growing up in Pittsburgh, 60% of the people that work in Pittsburgh work in heavy manufacturing. Today, it's less than 10%. Uh, but our, our employment is, is equal to what it was back in the heyday of the steel because we've been hugely successful at driving uh, economic development based on the research going on at the university, and particularly Carnegie Mellon University, who partners uh, with this institution here uh, on, on a number of developments. And, um, and one of the things we did, we built a building uh, for CMU. We helped finance it on their campus that would be an incubator, but not for sort of startup companies. We had those too, but this is for the Googles, and Microsofts and others that bring in 20 or 30 engineers that collaborate on research with CMU. Well, well guess, guess what happens? Out in the east end of Pittsburgh, which is not far from the universities, but it's one of the rundown areas of the city, um, we first decide to turn it around by, by buying an old Sears building. Now, you know how bad this neighbors was when Sears left. And, and, the, and the Sears building had been vacant for maybe 15 or 20 years. It was 15 acres that had been polluted because they had a garage there since the 30s. And, and we decided, what is, what are, where do rich people and poor people go to shop? And we decided Home Depot was where they go. Um, you know, and we called up the real estate people at Home Depot, and we said, we'd really love you to think about putting a shop here. You know, the nearest interstate is 10 miles away. And the nearest Home Depot is 10 miles away. And they looked at this site and this is, they said, this is not where we would put Home Depot. And we said, give us a shot. And he said, there's no chance. And so I called up the mayor of Atlanta at the time and said, tell me about the two guys that own Home Depot. And he said, particularly Bernie Marcus um, is really philanthropic in the Atlanta area. And he's very active in national Jewish affairs uh, around the country. And so I went to my friends in the Jewish community and I said, can you invite Bernie Marcus uh, to come to Pittsburgh to speak? And he did. And a friend of mine had a reception for him before the, before the dinner and the speech. And we kidnapped him. You know, and I had a bodyguard with a gun. So, and we literally, true story, put him in a car, took him over here and said, be part of our dream. We think your Home Depot can turn this neighborhood around. Uh, we think it could be the driver to change the whole dynamic. of it. And he said, boy, this is not where we put our stores. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we kept talking, and after the dinner, and some of my friends at the dinner, I think, talked to him. He came up to me after the dinner, and he said, I'll put a store there, but you need to help us with it. And, and, and he called me every six months. The best partner I've ever had uh, in terms of not only putting the store in a place where they didn't think about putting stores. Now they do in urban areas. I want you to know I was there just a couple weeks ago talking to the manager. It's the highest performing store in the Pittsburgh market. It's outperforming every suburban store. But what happened when Home Depot went there? Whole Foods came. Whole Foods is the first, I mean, Whole Foods. Now, you know, we didn't have a Whole Foods, so that's a big deal for us, right? And, and Whole Foods locates in this neighborhood, uh, and we helped finance it and, uh, in an old warehouse. And, and then the Wall Street, uh, the New York Times just did a big article about this neighborhood because guess what? There was a, this bakery. This is an old Nabisco plant that had sat bacon for 20 years. And we've done a public-private partnership. This is right down the street from Home, Beto, Home Be Depot. And guess who now, just two months ago, announces they're going to take this building? Google's moving 800 employees to Pittsburgh into a neighborhood that they wouldn't have thought about going to 10 years ago but one that has that vibrancy and excitement that you get just in a city. And, and, and they're coming out of that little incubator that was on the campus where they had 20 or 30 people. They were doing joint research with CMU. They like what they were doing, and they're moving their, this whole group there. So uh, it, it is, it's about architecture, and it's about how people come together. You know, we keep thinking about technology is going to take us apart. Is I think people put more and more value on coming together. But there's another piece of this story, which is Pittsburgh had 17,000 public housing units. 
And these are, these are the highest crime rate, highest poverty rate census tracts in the city. 17,000, almost 35,000 people lived in public housing. And they were marginalized both by where they lived and about the conditions they lived. And, and so I decided we needed to change it. I live right near a public housing community, a large one, 1,700 units, saw the conditions for long before I became mayor and made a decision that we were going to change public housing. And, and, and this was Aliquipateras. This was 1,700 units of public housing that had been built in 1939 and hadn't changed. And, 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 and my view was, if you can't get 30,000 of your residents into the opportunities of Pittsburgh, you're never going to succeed as a city. You, you need to focus on how do you change that. And, and so we partnered with the tenants. Initially, they hung me in effigy and threw chairs at me at some meetings. But at some point, we built up trust that they believed we weren't going to tear these places down and um, wish them luck. And it was up to them. And we have created a mixed-use com community, uh, Hope Six, uh, uh, up against the university. Half of these are um, um, not public housing people. The other half are. Um, uh, and it has changed the dynamic of Pittsburgh. We did almost 6,500 units of public housing we tore down and, and have, have replaced that. And, uh, and, and, and it was in neighborhoods like this where uh, they were dilapidated, abandoned neighborhoods. And now this is one of the largest national historic districts in the, in the country. You have those same kind of bones here. You have incredible architecture here. And your ability to, to weave that together and to fill in the blank spaces with the kind of appropriate development become. We tore 100 units of public housing. What, again, what were architects smoking and drinking? They built these sort of three-story block-like buildings in this area that's incredibly historic. If you go there now, uh, right there in that lower picture, that's public housing. Uh, we built that. Half one of the units are public housing, one is um, market rate. The only way you'd be able to tell the difference when you walked in would be that the public housing one had a computer on. Because our, our commitment to public housing residents was that you were going to you were going to stay, stay with us technologically, and we put a computer and gave, gave lessons to them. I, I talked about the park. Pittsburgh uh, was a city that we didn't go near the rivers. We just worried about getting over, over them, and this has created huge value. In many ways, the billions of dollars of development we've done along the river have woven Pittsburgh together. And, and so, as I mentioned, we have almost 30 miles of riverfront park, and we had big parks, and you know, all this was um, with scrap yards and other, other dilapidated places that we now have converted uh, to parks in the city. And this is, this is an example. If you look here, you know, we were using our riverfront poor parking lot, just like you use your um, waterfront to dump sand and gravel on. <laughs> right? And is that the best use of a waterfront? So we... We, we threw the parking off and put trees there and put a trail there. And this building gets built as, as an apartment building right on a river that would have been overlooking a parking lot. But now these people come out their front door, go down there, and go all the way to Washington, D.C. if they want on a bike trail. It, you know, it, and these are empty nesters by and large in that. And when I went to a Christmas party they had right after they built the building, you know, they all were amazed they were living in the middle of the city. Um, riding bikes in their retirement. Never in a million years did they think that they'd move from a five-bedroom suburban house into the middle city. But that building, you know, they can walk around the block and go to the ballet and the opera and a whole host of other places or walk across that bridge and go to a baseball game. It's a great way to live. You have those pieces here. The challenge is really understanding how you put them together. And I want to just touch really quickly on Seattle, Chicago, and Baltimore as just sort of an example of, of the drivers that's happening, not just in Pittsburgh, but across the country. If you look at this very quickly, if you look at this line from 1990 to 2010, look at those declines in manufacturing. At the same time you look at that, look at education and health services, the increases. They're the economic drivers. It's just not people working in hospitals. It's, it's the value can be created from that. And in many ways, I think this reflects America's 
challenge is that I think we will succeed if we educate our population and if we understand that innovation will be the dri economic driver and how we take innovation into the marketplace will be the economic drivers. And, and this is an example of educational attainments. And I put this because I want to brag a moment because 30 years ago, because people could work in steel mills, you didn't need a high school education. You could go right into the steel mill, make a good living, buy a house, buy a boat. We, Pittsburgh was not ranked in the top 100 metropolitan areas in America in the percentage of our population with either high school or college education. We're number three in the country now in 30 years as a, uh, our population having, as a percentage with a high school education and number eight in the country as a percentage of our population having an undergraduate degree. That's a commitment in Pensacola that you need to be uncompromising about. If you're going to be successful, take advantage of this institution. It will be because you have a literate, educated, and motivated workforce. And you will have that only if you do education. The other is understanding how, how you take advantage of the research going on here and in other places and convert it to commerce. You know, Pittsburgh is nowhere near uh, the amount of, if you look at the amount of venture capital, right? right here being invested in, in, in San Jose at $7 billion. But, but if you look, Pittsburgh has had, between 1997 and 2007, the fastest growth of any place in the country. It, it's just not, you know, if Ken develops a, a great new widget here, the odds are to take that into the marketplace, that person is going to go to Boston or California to get some venture capital. And, it might be that that venture capitalist will say, you need to move it here. So there's a whole piece of this puzzle. How do you connect the dots in, in the civic and research community to make your community entrepreneurial friendly? It becomes very important. This is the other change, and you see bits of it here, and you see it all over the country. Is that These are building permits issued in the 90s. So in Chicago, in the 1990s, 7% of the building permits in metropolitan Chicago were being issued for downtown in the central city area. It's 45% now. Think about that. People are making a choice that they would rather live in downtown Chicago, or in downtown Denver, or in Portland, or Sacramento, or Seattle, than they would out in the far suburbs. What's driving that? Lots of choices. One is demographics. The two largest groups of people looking for housing are our are kids and people that look like me, empty nesters, right, that are looking, and, and they don't want to deal with the driving and the the unknown uncertainty of gasoline prices. And so every city is going to be impacted by this. This is beginning to be a national trend. Um, this, is, this is an example of cities all over the country. It will impact Pensacola. You're beginning to see it. It will accelerate, I think, as, as we talk about these changes. And um, um, I, I just want to go to your neighbor here, because they've done something really interesting. Uh, and this is the cost of development, of choices that you will make as a community. Um, in Tallahassee, they've done this. Uh, they're estimating they're going to add 50,000 people uh, to households to the Tallahassee area over the next 20 years. And, and they, they, they built out what it would take. So if you build one unit per acre, which is sort of some people's definition of heaven, Right? It costs nine and a half billion dollars to put in the infrastructure to, 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 to take care of that one unit per acre. That's $208,000 per household. There's, that's your tax money I'm talking about that has to build the roads, sewer, and water. Okay? So as you're looking at Pensacola growing, keep that in mind. If you're going to build out, you're going to have to pay for that infrastructure. That infrastructure, maybe there's some impact fees, but a lot of it will get absorbed by the public. If you build the eight units per acre, that Somerset or this development right around uh, here where we are, uh, it, it, it's cost you a billion dollars. You've cut it down nine times, and it costs $21,000 per household to build in a really attractive development, but not everybody gets the whole acre. And, and then if you do... 20 units per acre, it's only $12,000 per unit taxes to build that same infrastructure because you're building that infrastructure for a lot more people living on one acre. 
So when, when you start thinking about how Pensacola begins to grow, you, you ought to look at trying to do this kind of modeling and think about what, what is it going to do to my taxes by the choices we make and the kind of housing we built because of, that will drive our infrastructure costs. These are the lessons, quickly I'll go over. Nothing happens without leadership. Somebody needs to be willing to stick their head up. It can be civic, it can be political leadership, but it, it doesn't happen without leadership. And the hardest thing in the world to do is to change the status quo. It, and it, so it takes somebody willing to be a one-term mayor. who doesn't want to be a governor, who's not thinking about the next office. It, because it's going to be decisions that you might not like, but 20 years from now you're going to say, wow, we made the right decision. That, that's the big challenge. The second, the second is really you, you need the vision. You need to know where you want to go. You can't do all this development as a transaction. You know, I always am struck by our suburban communities. You know, there, there's a subdivision. I see people build 100 houses and, or 200 houses in a, a big 100-acre piece of property, and they put a nice trail through there. And then another guy comes and buys the next 100 acres, and they don't put a trail there. And if they had just talked to each other, you would have had a much longer trail. You could connect it. And so we all see these deals as transactions, not as part of a strategy. And, and that's really a challenge that every community faces. You know, it, there's an old story. I love it because it types, it, 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 and this is, this is, you all need to think about like this, is CNN was in France in 12, the 12th century doing interviews. And they went to the first guy and they said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm cutting stone. And he went to the second guy and said, what are you, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm cutting the arch stone for a door. And he, they went to the third guy to interview him. And he said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. That's what you all are doing. You're here tonight because you care about your community. You are all have businesses. Maybe you're civic leaders. You're, you're all part of building a cathedral, which is Pensacola. A place that you want your kids to come to, a place that you love, and it will work best if it gets connected in a strategic vision. So think about building the cathedral, not just about cutting the stone. The second I talked about our riverfronts is knowing what you want and be clear about it. Uh, and again, this is not responding to the transaction. You know, we were, I, when I first became mayor, if somebody came in and said they wanted to put an old, a new steel mill in Pittsburgh, I would have said yes. I would have said yes to anything because we were so desperate to bring people to us. And I had a planning director who got it, who understood that we, we have an opportunity to shape Pittsburgh in a different kind of way. And we might have been able to accommodate the, green, the, the steel mill, but it would have been a green steel mill. Uh, and uh, and, and cities, that, cities that succeed understand clearly what their values are, what their core pieces of what makes Pensacola great. And so somebody might come and say, I want to build a new office building in downtown Pensacola and put 500 jobs on there, but I need to tear down a half dozen of those old historic buildings. Now, you're going to have a big fight about that. But, but at the end of the day, if the core value of Pensacola is part of what I would think should be, part of the, the va historic value of what you have, which is really unusual to see in most of Florida, then you would say, you know what, we'd love to have you here. Maybe we can accommodate you over here, but these are too important to us. Th there are community decisions that get made piece by piece. This is, Pensacola won't become a cathedral on one decision. It will be a hundred incremental decisions over a period of years. Um, the, the fourth is the institutional capacity. It, is, if you're going to do these deals and you're going to begin to shape uh, a city that is spectacular. You need a capacity that it goes beyond the term of one mayor or, or one person that, is, that has a professional capacity that can be respond entrepreneurial, that can work. And, and, and that is a, a very critical part, often undervalued, a transparent public process. If I do a deal with a developer in Pittsburgh, you know, I, I, I can't have people believing it was a sweetheart deal, that it was corrupt. It needs to be a transparent process. People need to understand what the community value is and what we're giving the developer and why. 
people can sometimes disagree with that, but, but there needs to be a clear understanding. You know, I would have developers come in to my office every week and say, Mayor, I have a great idea for you or a great deal for you. And I'd say, with all due respect, you tell me what's a great deal for you. I'll decide whether it's a great deal for us. And if our self-interests meet, then we'll figure out how to make it work. So we put lots of money into public private partnerships because, you know, when you go to a, a developer and you say, we have a 100-acre steel mill, nobody knows what's under the ground. It has old buildings on it. It's been used for industrial property. You know, we'd like you to think about developing this. He says, I can go buy 100 acres out in the country with a lot less hassle. So what does it take to get that developer to come? How do you make that deal? That becomes so critical if, uh, in the trans uh, process. Uh, um, financing. You know, if you're going to have a public-private partnership, you need to come to the table with something. And, and so we created a whole uh, value of financing tools. Land control was a very important piece of us. How do you put, if, you, if land is important, how do you get control of it or work with people that have control of it to do the development? And this is why architects are so important. Design. You know, I go around the country and I go to a lot of cities and I come to the conclusion that in a lot of water there's a disease. It's called it'll do disease. You know, we're gonna, we want to build this building convention center or new housing, but you know, that's really all we can afford. It'll do. Do you want to be known as an it'll do town? You're not now. You have a sense of excellence about you, just in the quick tour I did around. It, it really is, is on you now to keep that. And, and, and so design and the quality of design, and how do you get there and the relationship you have conversations with developers to be sure that design is not seen as a transaction but part of the big picture becomes hugely important to all, to this community and incrementally again building uh, something really spectacular. And, and that you know, if you've been to Millennium Park, and you know, the Millennium Park in Chicago is a great example of something that morphed from a, you know, just sort of a grassy area on top of a park to, to one of the most spectacular places in America. Um, and the other is trust and confidence. Is if I'm going to form a partnership with a developer to do a 10 or 20 year build out of an old industrial site, they need to believe that we're going to deliver and I need to believe that they're going to deliver. And that becomes a very important part of the conversation. So, so it's on you. You know, when I was, my wife and I were in the Peace Corps many years ago, we learned a, an enduring lesson. Uh, we lived in a village, a three-day boat ride up the Paraguay River. Um, and there were no roads, and we lived in a pretty remote area. And we spoke Spanish, and through the jungle a few miles was, uh, was Brazil. They spoke Portuguese, and around us was... Uh, a lot of Indian tribes who spoke a number of different languages, and the enduring lesson we learned was that it wasn't the person with all the guns or all the money that was the most powerful person in town. It was the person who spoke all the languages. <laughs> and, and, and when we came back to America, we realized that we were even more divided, and that we are divided by race and by class, by where we work. You know, people that are running this computer out have no idea half the time what they were talking about. Uh, 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 so we have these different languages and I've come to realize the most important person in our society are people I call translators. People that can, uh, can communicate across the divides of society and communicate a common vision that people see a place for themselves there. Th that's the challenge in every community is the, is the value of those translators, to raise them up to bring people together around a common vision that will drive your community. You have good bones here. Your challenge is whether you're going to find the translators that articulate a common vision that takes Pensacola to from really a wonderful place to a spectacular place. That's your challenge. Good luck. Uh, raise your hand if you have questions, and Michelle has a mic. What's that? Hey, right here. He's the first one. <laughs> uh, slide six was about financing, right. and that just went by real fast. I didn't want to and ask you to memorize it, okay? <laughs> I, could you go over that a little more, please? Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to... This is a wonk here, I can tell, right? He's a policy wonk, but... but 
the issue is, if you're going to form public-private partnerships, you, you need to bring resources to the table. You can't go to a developer and say, we'd love you to come, but you need to pay for everything. Particularly if they're difficult sites, or you're asking them to go into a market that nobody's sure whether, whether anybody will buy the house. So, so when we're building uh, houses on a slag dump, nobody's sure if anybody will live on a slag dump. And, and so, so you, there's, a, there's got to be a willingness to share that risk if you're going to change the, the, the conversation. Otherwise, I'm sure I can go around Pensacola, and I know I can in the downtown, and see vacant, some vacant lots and surface parking lots and probably blighted areas. And maybe they've been like that, and you got used to driving by them. And, and every city's like that, and we were like that. And so how do you change that conversation? The market's not working. I'm going to sound very conservative here, is that our view was market-driven. What does it take for us to engage with the private sector to get the market to work in areas where the market is not working. Because we believed if we could make early investments we could create, the market would, would respond. And, and so we created a whole series of financing tools that we would mix and match. Some of these are our local tools, some of them are um, state funds, some of them are federal funds. And we would act as the agent. So if a developer wants to do something, the last thing they want to do is spend the next 10 years of their life fighting with 15 different agencies. So we took responsibility for that. So what you see here is a whole series of financing mechanisms. Let me just pick one out, uh, several. Tax increment financing. Do all, do, how many of you know what tax increment financing is? Let me just quickly explain it. Is, is that we have an old steel mill that produces $1,000 a year in taxes now, vacant steel mill. And we work with a private developer, and the private developer says, you know, if I build $600 million worth of development, it's going to produce, for the sake of discussion, $10,000 in property taxes. So that difference between what it's producing the day, the $1,000, and the $10,000 it will produce is called the increment, the $9,000. And, and our law, and I believe Florida law, permits you to take that uh, money and to use it to finance a bond issue. So you... We, we would not take the whole $9,000. We'd take 60% of it. We'd pledge that to finance, to pay for a bond issue, essentially like a mortgage, uh, for the next 20 or 30 years. In return, we'd take that cash now that we got, and instead of buying the house, we'd use it to put in the infrastructure. We'd use it to put in sewer and water, maybe to clean up the environmental issues, maybe to build parking garages because we want higher density. Uh, and... And we use that very effectively. And recently, a study was done of the tax increment deals we did. Uh, we generated almost $20 million in additional property taxes for the city over the course of, of the development. And, and so it was very successful. The other we did was very, very uh, uh, challenging. You, you would see here the uh, Pittsburgh Development Fund. Uh, recognizing that we needed money in my first two months as mayor, we diverted revenue out of our operating budget and reduced, reduced the city's workforce and, and, and created a $60 million development fund. That was our own money. It wasn't money that we needed to go to the state or the federal government with. We used it to buy a lot of the land. It was a loan fund, so it was patient money, though, meaning we would, could lend it and it would take three to five years maybe to pay it back. It became a huge... Um, a huge asset for us, and again, a study was recently done just the last couple of weeks, and it showed that that $60 million has turned over three times in the last 15 years from when we created it in terms of being involved in deals. And so I, I just mentioned several of those because it, it, you need tools. You need to be entrepreneurial. You need to be able to respond uh, quickly to a developer. Uh, and figure out how to make the deal work. So I would always say, you know, we want you to make m money, Mr. Developer, but I don't want you to pick my pocket. So it was understanding what we perceived as the risk in the market and our willingness to, to, to put money in the deal. Us, yes, right behind you, Michelle. Okay. Uh, Carnegie used to be a big steel company, nationally or internationally. You're giving away your age. <laughs> what, uh, what is the primary reason that the steel industry collapsed, collapsed in Pittsburgh? 
because everybody of uh, building of anything of any importance needs steel. Well, I think there, were, I mean, there was multiple reasons. One was that we had the oldest mills in the country. And my father, when he was working there and I was a young boy, would always come home and say, you know, these mills aren't going to last. We're using chewing gum and paper clips to make them work. You know, and you can imagine these huge pieces of machinery using chewing gum and paper clips. And, and, and so there was a lack of an, a continued investment. Uh, we rebuilt the rest of the world after World War II. So Germany and Korea and a host of other places had the most modern mills in the world. And so they were, they were beating the pants off of us in terms of efficiency and cost. Um, and, and then in the 60s, really, the steel industry, uh, the management and the union, I think, thought they controlled the market. And they made some contracts that made no sense, 13 weeks vacation. And, uh, you know, and I blame both sides because they, they thought they essentially had a monopoly. And so they did these contracts that were not sustainable. Uh, and, and so I, I think it was a combination of no, not modernizing. So when the mills went down, they went down very quickly um, uh, to competition and I think bad, uh, bad choices. Uh, and, uh, and what is interesting, there are a couple mills not in the city but outside the city and where there's one called the Edgar Thompson Works, is a U.S. steel mill, uh, and where there were 12,000 <clears throat> men and women making steel 30 years ago, there's less than, there's 700 now. And they're, it's the same production. It's just technology has changed it. Here's something that's very interesting. Allegheny Technology, which is headquartered in Pittsburgh and is the largest stainless steel manufacturer in the country, uh, just announced about eight months ago that they're building a brand new stainless steel mill um, right uh, uh, outside of the city in a suburban community, which says to me that the international competition is beginning to shift. And I think technology is the driver because I think labor costs are now a very small part of what we would think of normally as a very labor-intensive industry. So I, I, it gives me moment, a, a moment of optimism that we as a country, again, might become competitive in manufacturing where uh, productivity, because of technological improvement, has changed the dynamics. Back there. I'm sorry. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Murphy. I'd like to know how much the economic condition of your disadvantaged populations uh, improved uh, after you became mayor from the time that you became mayor to the present day, and how was that achieved other than the public housing? Um, several. We, uh, our, our minority population, predominantly African American uh, in Pittsburgh, very low. We had no major immigration in Pittsburgh for the last 40 years. So we have 1% Hispanic and 1% Asian population, and virtually they're all in Pittsburgh because of the universities. Um, and and uh, African American population in Pittsburgh is about 30%. Um, and we're relatively economically well off because of the steel industry. Uh, and when the steel industry collapsed, they get proportionally hurt much more uh, than the majority population. And uh, we. Um, we focus why we go after PNC Bank that locate in the city, 2,500 jobs, 1,700 new ones, is because if they locate in the suburbs, those jobs are completely inaccessible to the minority population because there's not good public transportation. Um, and we built what we did with Home Depot, PNC, and any business we were able to get in Pittsburgh, we built a uh, partnership through our career training program, our, our Department of Human Resources in the city, that we would initially do recruiting for them, uh, deal with drugs and the other issues, and then refer people to them that they had every right to accept or not accept. Home Depot was our best partner. Uh, and, and as an example, Home Depot located in a predominantly minority neighborhood, um, and we had set aside a part of the parking lot for employees parking. In, um, Bernie Marcus, when one of his six-month calls, called me and said, you know, you can develop that surface parking lot. Eighty percent of the people working at Home Depot are walking to work. Um, so in broad numbers, I can't give you. We still, as every community does, struggle with a sort of an impoverished group of people. Um, that, uh, but for us, the transportation was very important. And one of the little tests, I didn't do it in Pensacola, but one of the little tests I do is when I fly into an airport, 
I like to take public transportation into the city. <laughs> I, I, I got my answer, okay? Um, and and I, as an example, I, I did this in Charlotte, okay? And I got the same response. But actually, I took a bus from the airport in Charlotte to downtown Charlotte. It cost me $2. It was a good ride. Probably took me twice as long. And why do I do that? Because in most cities, uh, the center of employment is the downtown, and the second largest employment center in many communities is out around the airport. And if those jobs are not accessible by public transportation, I'm going to guess 20 to 30 percent of your population in Pensacola, it's true for most communities, don't have ready access to an automobile. And so if those jobs at the airport that you have, uh, they might as well be in Pittsburgh if I can't get to them on a regular, convenient public transportation. It, it becomes a very important part of that building that cathedral of how do you connect the job opportunities um, by transportation to people. And then the second is, how do you begin to match the skills? So the education thing is critically important. I, I don't know what your school system's doing, but that's where it begins. You, and, and, and then you build a system. Of, as you bring people in, as you work with them to try to hire local people, you try to match them through the community college, which is an important partner in all this, to get the skills beyond high school that they need, but not necessarily a college education. So there's a system that you need to build that we worked on, and I'm not going to suggest it was perfect, that attempted to address your question. Time for one more brief question. Yes, sir. You partially answered what I was going to, and with this renaissance, did you all publicly go out with putting minority people, minority business, where they could be visibly be seen, and not just a few as a token? I think this is very important. When the Charleston, uh, South Carolina mayor was here a few years ago, I heard him talk, and I asked him the question, and he said one of the most difficult things they had, the Charleston renaissance, is bringing minorities to the forefront in a meaningful way. Did you all seek to do that? We, uh, we built a very aggressive program to do that, and I'm going to tell you it was very difficult. Um, it was very difficult because we were doing, uh, building a baseball stadium for $270 million and a football stadium for $370 million. There was not a lot of local minority contractors. We built a mentoring system. Uh, with majority contractors and minority contractors, and we paired them together. Uh, and so that they would, they, the, uh, that the minorities that were, dimly, were doing small would develop some talents. And so not only for the general, but for a lot of the subs, we began to build that. And, and we set some goals for ourselves to try to hire, um, you know, I, I believe it was about 20 to 25 percent, and I'm going to guess we got to about 15 percent. Uh, on some of those projects. So it was a very focused, uh, focused effort on our part to try to create uh, a, sort of a, a whole group of people that would begin to grow in terms of their ability to do serious jobs. And uh, I think the overall challenge uh, for us, I mean, there's a statistic that for me is astounding that I think sums it up. And it is that uh, in the average will probated, this is a few years ago in America, for a white uh, person who dies is about $100,000. Um, and for the average African-American person who dies, it's about $10,000. And, and it's really about ownership of a house. That, that creates that value. And, and the, I think the challenge that we face in every community is to give people that have historically not had the opportunities the opportunities to create wealth. And so whether it is contractors building wealth uh, uh, or other opportunities, if we don't do that in a community, your community will not be a world-class community. Let me give you an end in this, one astounding statistic. 47% of the people in the United States under 18 years old are not white. I want you to think about that. 47%. And, and so if we can't, if a community can't figure out how to embrace diversity and have that diversity succeed, you, you can't succeed in the world today. It's as simple as that. You know, and there's huge battles about immigration. I won't get into all that. But at the end of the day, if we can't figure out how we create tolerance and, and celebrate diversity as an asset rather than as a liability, we lose. Thank you. Thank you.